Section Zero of The Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America by D. W. Griffith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. The Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America by D. W. Griffith. Why censor the motion picture? The laboring man's university. Fortunes are spent every year in our country in teaching the truths of history, that we may learn from the mistakes of the past a better way for the present and future. The truths of history today are restricted to the limited few attending our colleges and universities. The motion picture can carry these truths to the entire world without cost, while at the same time bringing diversions to the masses. As tolerance would thus be compelled to give way before knowledge, and as the deadly monotony of the cheerless existence of millions would be brightened by this new art, two of the chief causes making war possible would be removed. The motion picture is war's greatest antidote. End of section zero. Section one of The Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America by D. W. Griffith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America Freedom of speech and publication is guaranteed in the Constitution of the United States and in the Constitution of practically all the states. Unjustifiable speech or publication may be punished but cannot be forbidden in advance. Mayor Gaynor, that great jurist who stood out from the ordinary gallery-playing hypocritical type of politician as a white rose stands out from a field of sewer-fed weeds, said in vetoing a moving picture censorship ordinance in the city of New York, quote, ours is a government of free speech and a free press. That is the cornerstone of free government. The phrase, the press, includes all methods of expression by writing or pictures. If this moving picture ordinance be legal, then a similar ordinance in respect to the newspapers and to the theaters generally would be legal." End quote. Today, the censorship of moving pictures throughout the entire country is seriously hampering the growth of the art. Had intelligent opposition to censorship been employed when it first made itself manifest, it could easily have been overcome. But the pygmy child of that day has grown to be not merely a man, but a giant. And I tell you who read this, whether you will or no, he is a giant whose forces of evil are so strong that he threatens that priceless heritage of our nation, freedom of expression. The right of free speech has cost centuries upon centuries of untold sufferings and agonies. It has cost rivers of blood. It has taken as its toll uncounted fields littered with the carcasses of human beings. All this that there might come to live and survive that wonderful thing, the power of free speech. In our country, it has taken some of the best blood of our forefathers. The revolution itself was a fight in this direction for the God-given beautiful idea of free speech. Afterwards, the first assault on the right of free speech, guaranteed by the Constitution, occurred in 1798, when Congress passed the Sedition Law. 
which made it a crime for any newspaper or other printed publication to criticize the government. Partisan prosecution of editors and publishers took place at the instance of the party in power, and popular indignation was aroused against this abridgment of liberty to such an extent that Thomas Jefferson, the candidate of the opposition party for president, was triumphantly elected. And after that, nothing more was heard of the sedition law which expired by limitation in 1801. The integrity of free speech and publication was not again attacked seriously in this country until the arrival of the motion picture, when this new art was seized by the powers of intolerance as an excuse for an assault on our liberties. The motion picture is a medium of expression as clean and decent as any mankind has discovered. A people that would allow the suppression of this form of speech would unquestionably submit to the suppression of that which we all consider so highly, the printing press. And yet we find all through the country, among all classes of people, the idea that the motion picture should be censored when the first small band of censorship was established six years ago, we who took it seriously then expected exactly what has come to pass, that a man of the mental caliber of the captain of police of Chicago can tell two million American people what they shall and shall not go to see in the way of a moving picture they tell us we must not show crime in a motion picture we cannot listen to such nonsense these people would not have us show the glories and beauties of the most wonderful moral lesson the world has ever known the life of christ because in that story we must show the vice of the traitor judas iscariot had the modern censors existed in past ages and followed out their theories to a logical conclusion, there would have been written no Iliad of Homer. There would not have been written for the glory of the human race that grand cadence of uplift called the Bible. There would have been no Goethe. There would have been no thrilling, beautiful dramas given us as the grandest heritage of the English-speaking race, the plays of Shakespeare. And even today, none of these creations would these worthy censors leave in our possession, had they their way. All new things in the world, including the Christian imagery and the printing press at their beginnings, have been considered as instruments of evil and subject to suspicion. The motion picture has had to undergo the same ordeal that seems to be directed at all new things. In some communities, they do not allow the showing of crime in any form in any motion picture. This, followed to its logical conclusions, would make absolutely impossible the motion picture as an entertainment or as an art. How is it possible to portray virtue without portraying its opposite, the thing of vice? Friedrich Schiller, the great German dramatist, speaking of the moral of the drama, said, quote, It is the course of mortal things that the good should be shadowed by the bad, and virtue shine the brightest when contrasted with vice. Whoever proposes to discourage vice and to vindicate religion, morality, and social order against their enemies must unveil crime in all its deformity and place it before the eyes of men in its colossal magnitude. He must diligently explore its dark mazes and make himself familiar with sentiments at the wickedness of which his soul revolts. End quote. Sir
Search your minds for any story worth telling or any play that is worth seeing that does not in some way show vice in some form. The policy of the generally accepted censorship is to approve of pictures which offend no one. That is one way of saying we will have nothing in the pictures but milk and water, ridiculous insipid mediocrity that could not possibly interest anyone. A motion picture of this class would be as interesting and efficient as a newspaper that never steps on anyone's toes, and you could imagine how many people would be interested in that kind of a newspaper. We believe that we have as much right to present the facts of history as we see them on the motion picture screen as a Guzot, a Bancroft, a Ferrari, or a Woodrow Wilson has to write these facts in his history. We believe it as a right under the Constitution of the United States, and we are supported in this belief by wise judicial decisions in cases where the matter has been presented to the courts in the right way. Speaking on the Klansmen, Judge Cooper said, quote, Every night, in every fair-sized community in this broad land where the stage instructs or entertains, each and every play has its good characters and its bad characters portrayed, both of which are essential to a play in the rounding out of the moral of the play, and without which moral a play is of no educational value. If all the plays in which a villain had played were stopped, the theater as an educator and entertainer of the people would become a memory. End quote. The foremost educators of the country have urged upon us moving picture producers to put away the slapstick comedies, the ridiculous, sentimental mush stories, the imitation of the cheap magazines, and go to the fields of history for our subjects. They have told us repeatedly that the motion picture can impress upon a people as much of the truth of history in an evening as many months of study will accomplish. As one eminent divine has said to the masses, it teaches history by lightning. We would like very much to do this. The reason for the slapstick and the worst that is in the pictures is censorship. Let those who tell us to uplift our art invest money in the production of a historic play of the time of Christ. They will find that this cannot be staged without incurring the wrath of a certain part of our people. The massacre of St. Bartholomew, if produced, will tread upon the toes of another part of our people. I was considering the production of the history of the American people only this last year. It got into the papers. From all over the country, I was strongly advised that this was not the time for a play on the American Revolution, because the English and their sympathizers would not take kindly during these emotional war times, the part the English played in the wars of the American Revolution, and that the pro-German would not care to see the Hessians play the part they would play in the story of our freedom. In other words, as long as censorship holds the motion picture under its thumb, it is in every way enslaved. It dares not speak the truth on any subject, and therefore must confine itself to ridiculous, injurious, and childish slapstick and absurd and weak dramatology. The moral reformers plead with us to put on pictures which speak editorially against certain evils of the day. 
how does any man dare to invest his money in any picture that speaks against any certain class or condition of people however evil and open to condemnation their works may be when he knows how easy it is for a few individuals to go to any one of the many hundreds of censorship boards in the country and influence them to destroy the property which the producer has gone to great pains and care to build up however alluring the theory of censorship may be to a certain well-meaning people in its practical working out experience has taught us that whatever section or class of the people may feel offended by a particular production their objection is found to have a vote value to the politicians who in turn are very often influential in the actual work of the censors i have already quoted a passage from the veto message of the late mayor gaynor of new york but mr gaynor went even further than this in his expression of legal opinion he declared in so many words that the censorship of moving pictures is a direct violation of the united states constitution because it is an abridgment of the freedom of publication so long as this matter of censorship is allowed so long as in a city the size of chicago for example one or more men may tell two million persons what they shall or shall not see in a motion picture in the theaters of chicago so long as this is allowed so long as even one man is given the privilege over another of deciding for him the thing he shall or shall not see in the way of even the simplest of motion pictures then there is no such thing as entire freedom of speech in that community the press of the country can awaken the people to the truth of these conditions already some of the greatest journalists of the country have been brought to see the light i quote here from mr lewis sherwin the eminent drama critic of the new york globe who upon hearing of the efforts to suppress the birth of a nation wrote quote, this is absolutely against public policy against the spirit of the constitution against the very life and essence of what should be true american and democratic ideas the mere fact of the races constituting the population of the united states being shown in an unpleasant light is no argument whatsoever if this factor is to be seriously considered there is hardly any limit to which censorship may not go End quote. again bernard shaw the brilliant irish dramatist speaking on the morals of the cinema in england says quote, the danger of the cinema is not the danger of immorality but of morality people who like myself frequent the cinemas testify to their desolating romantic morality there is no comedy no wit no criticism of morals by ridicule or otherwise no exposure of the unpleasant consequences of romantic sentimentality and reckless tomfoolery in real life nothing that could give a disagreeable shock to the stupid or shake the self-complacency of the smug the leveling down has been thoroughly accomplished End quote. i thoroughly believe that the principal reason for the popularity of the motion picture is that it softens the hard life of the plain people with beauty and sweetness it keeps men away from saloons and drink because it gives them a place of recreation and pleasant surroundings it brings to the poor who are unable to travel away from their dingy surroundings the beauty and poetry of living foreign scenes of people of flowers and waving grasses one thing remember however 
unimportant or however crude may happen to be the mannequins that tell the story in our foreground beneath their feet are green grasses and flowers behind this is a backdrop of beauty of waving seas curving hills or created mountain tops and this backdrop must express a message of pure and sweet beauty for if we believe we must confess that this was done by the hand of god himself the most beautiful picture ever put on canvas the finest statue ever carved is a ridiculous caricature of real life compared with the flickering shadow of a tattered film in a backwoods nickelodeon says dr e e slosson of the columbia university in an article entitled the birth of a new art and published in the independent on april sixth nineteen fourteen nations of today are the result of the experiences of nations of the past every human being is made up of his own past experiences if all the people of today were really educated and knew the history of the world since the beginning of time, there would be no wars, there would be no capital punishment, there would be less evil from America's favorite sins of hate, hypocrisy, and intolerance. It is ignorance that makes possible the terrible waves of hatred that have caused our many wars and murders, inspired by politics, religion, and all the various other causes. This is the reason for the teaching of history. We force our children to spend many years in schools. At least a few months of this time in an average education are spent in the study of history. Six moving pictures would give these students more knowledge of the history of the world than they have obtained from their entire study. Besides these, the vast majority who cannot spare the time for this study could in a few hours get an excellent idea of the history of the world since its beginning from moving pictures history is valuable since through the experiences and mistakes of the past we are able to guide our footsteps into the future but how is the moving picture art to express these great lessons of history and convey the morals of the present day contrasted with their attendant vices if it is to be muzzled by a petty and narrow-minded censorship a censorship which can see no valuable message in vice punished a censorship which refuses to have life portrayed in its actuality, with its sins and virtues, its joys and sadness, that we may learn the better way. According to the theory of the censors, the moving picture producers must slavishly avoid the truth, for fear of treading the toes of races, politicians, and individuals. With a censorship board dictating what pictures are to be produced and displayed, truth is not to be pictured, but a sugar-coated, virtuously garbed version alone can be presented in order to satisfy the public mentors of our so-called morals. For example, the moving pictures dare not even hint the possibility of wrong conduct of the Democrats in Atlanta, of the Republicans in a northern state, or the wets in another vicinity, of the police in Chicago, of the Germans in Milwaukee, of the Irish in another community. Every time you enter a moving picture theater where films are subject to censorship, you are forced to accept such pictures as some self-constituted or otherwise appointed board may allow you to see. 
and your inalienable right of freely selecting your photodrama your literature your philosophy your knowledge of life has been slyly taken away from you now what is the moving picture film ordinarily it consists either of a pictorial chronicle of current events illustrated and explained by a written text or of historical happenings or of stories comic features or some comedy or tragedy of human life in every essential feature the moving picture film is a publication within the meaning of the constitutional guarantee the moving pictures are, in fact, a pictorial press, performing in a modern and entertaining and instructive manner, all the functions of the printed press. Now, the same reasons which make a censorship of the printed press unconstitutional and intolerable to Americans make a censorship of the pictorial press unconstitutional and intolerable. The theory of the constitutional guarantee, in brief, is this. Every American citizen has a constitutional right to publish anything he pleases, either by speech or in writing, or in print, or in pictures subject to his personal liability after publication to the penalties of violating any law such as the law forbidding obscenity libel and other matters legally unfit for publication but the distinction between this theory and a censorship is that a censorship passes upon and forbids printing a picture before publication and so directly controverts the most valuable of all our liberties under the Constitution, which our fathers established for our guidance and our protection. If the pictorial press can be subjected to censorship by a mere act of Congress, then so can the printed press. And, of course, there would be an end at once to the freedom of writing and printing the constitutional and rightful manner in which to keep the moving pictures within proper bounds is simply to make and to enforce laws which will severely punish those persons who exhibit improper pictures as a matter of fact there are laws now on the statute books which are ample to punish all who deserve punishment it is simply a question of enforcement so that the creation of federal censorship is absolutely unnecessary. It is said the motion picture tells its story more vividly than any other art. In other words, we are to be blamed for efficiency, for completeness. Is this justice? Is this common sense? We do not think so. We have no wish to offend with indecencies or obscenities, but we do demand, as a right, the liberty to show the dark side of wrong, that we may illuminate the bright side of virtue, the same liberty that is conceded to the art of the written word, that art which we owe the Bible and the works of Shakespeare. End of section one. Section 2 of The Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America by D. W. Griffith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Late Mayor Gaynor's Censorship Fido. Text of His Honor's Letter to the Board of Aldermen on the Picture Ordinance of New York, December 27th, 1912 to the honorable the board of aldermen gentlemen i return disapproved the proposal ordinance number eighty nine entitled an ordinance relative to motion picture theaters 
I am constrained to do this because of the provisions therein creating a censorship. It is provided that the Board of Education shall appoint one or more censors to examine all motion pictures in advance and determine whether they shall be exhibited or not. It has hitherto been the understanding of this country that no censorship can be established by law to decide in advance what may or may not be lawfully printed or published. Ours is a government of free speech and a free press. That is the cornerstone of free government. The phrase, the press, includes all methods of expression of writing or pictures. In past ages, there were censorships to decide what might be published or even believed. Every Christian denomination has at one time or another been subjected to such censorship. The few were very anxious not to give freedom of speech or of the press. They thought the many were not fit for it. They therefore set themselves up as censors and guardians over the bulk of their fellow men. The center of thought was then among the few, and they were very anxious to keep it there. But in the course of time, in spite of all opposition, the center of thought began to pass from the few to the many, where it is today. It was then that censorships and all interference with freedom of speech, of the press, and of opinion began to give way by degrees until, in the end, all of them, at all events, eventually were abolished. And that is now substantially true under all free governments throughout the world. In our fundamental instruments of government in this country, which we call Constitution, we expressly guarantee from the beginning free speech and a free press, and prohibited the passing of any law abridging the same. The provision in the Constitution of this state on that subject, which is substantially the same as the like provision in the Constitution of the United States, and also of the states generally, is as follows. Quote, Every citizen may freely speak, write, and publish his sentiments on all subjects, being responsible for the abuse of that right, and no law shall be passed to restrain or abridge the liberty of speech or of the press. End quote. So universal has been the opinion that these constitutional provisions abolished all censorship of the press and forbade them in the future, that I have been able to find only one attempt in this country to set up such a censorship before this one of yours. Our constitutional provision plainly is that publication whether oral or printed or by writing or by pictures, shall not be restrained in advance, but that everyone shall be free to speak or publish what he sees fit, subject to being prosecuted afterwards for libel, immorality, obscenity, or indecency therefore. There seem to be a few among us who wish us to retrace our steps and resort to censorships again in advance of publication and make it a crime to publish anything not permitted in advance by the censor. Do they know what they are doing? Do they know anything of the history and literature of the subject? Do they know that the censorships of past ages did immeasurably more harm than good? Do they ever stop to think that such censorships now would do even more harm than they did in past ages, in comparison with what little good they might possibly do? I do not believe the people of this country are ready to permit any censor 
to decide in advance what may be published for them to read or what pictures may be exhibited to them. Our laws forbid the publication of any libelous, obscene, indecent, immoral, or impure literature or reading matter. Is not that enough? If anyone does this, he commits a criminal offense and may be punished therefor. If this ordinance be legal, then a similar ordinance in respect to the newspapers and the theaters generally would be legal. Are you of the opinion that you have any such power as that? If so, you should probably begin with the newspapers and the so-called high-class theaters. Once revive the censorship, and there is no telling how far we may carry it. These moving picture shows are attended by the great bulk of the people, many of whom cannot afford to pay the prices charged by the theaters. They are a solace and an education to them. Why are we singling out these people as subjects necessary to be protected by a censorship? Are they any more in need of protection by censorship than the rest of the community? That was once the view which prevailed in government, and there are some among us, ignorant or untaught by past ages, who are of that view now. Are they better than the rest of us, or worse? When I became mayor, the denunciation of these moving picture shows by a few people was at its highest. They declared them schools of immorality. They said indecent and immoral pictures were being shown there. I personally knew that was not so. But I had an official examination made of all the moving picture shows in this city. The result was actual proof and an official report that there were no obscene or immoral pictures shown in these places. And that is the truth now. Wherefore, then, is all this seal for censorship over these places? The truth is that the good, moral people who go to these moving picture shows and very often bring their children with them would not tolerate the exhibition of obscene or immoral pictures there. A place in which such pictures were exhibited would soon be without sufficient patrons to support it. At all events, the criminal law is ample to prevent the exhibition of such pictures. I have asked these people who are crying out against the moving picture shows to give us an instance of an obscene or immoral picture being shown in them, so that the exhibitor may be prosecuted but they have been unable to do so. What they insist on is to have the pictures examined in advance and allowed or prohibited. That is what they are still doing in Russia with pictures and with reading matter generally. Do they really want us to recur to that system? Perhaps I should say I understand that Comparatively few of your honorable body are in favor of the censorship. Many of you voted for the whole ordinance in the belief that the mayor has the right to veto the censorship provisions and let the rest of the ordinance stand. But I find that the mayor may not do that. The censorship provisions are not independent of the rest of the ordinance but interdependent and so connected therewith that the whole ordinance must stand or fall as a whole i trust you will pass the ordinance which the commission has prepared it safeguards these most important and wholesome places of amusement physically and morally respectfully w j gaynor mayor End of section two.
Section 3 of The Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America by D. W. Griffith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Motion Picture Censor. Saturday Evening Post Editorial, July 23rd, 1915. The instinct to look after your neighbor's morals, however unsuccessful you may be looking after your own, is eradicable in human nature. If printing were a new art, invented, say, in the 19th century, it would undoubtedly be under a comprehensive censorship. There would be a college of censors in the postal department to scrutinize every printed sheet that went through the mails. There would be state censors whose political activities had been of such nature as to inspire the governor with great faith in their general discretion. New York, Chicago, and other large cities would have local boards, probably affiliated with the police departments, and very zealous in seeing that the minds of the young were not corrupted by printed words, which tended to raise doubts of the police department's intelligence and integrity. Recent issues of Chicago newspapers containing information that policemen had been indicted for grafting would have appeared with the corrupting columns carefully blacked over in the Russian manner. Motion pictures are a new art, and a complicated system of censorship is growing up around them. There is no particular reason for censoring motion pictures more than anything else, except that they are new, and their unsettled status gives the censorious instinct a chance to assert itself. Crime of all sorts is constantly described in print that is within the reach of any literate child possessed of a penny. It is constantly shown on the stage, the illusion of which is much more powerful than that of the motion picture. End of section three. Section four of The Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America by D. W. Griffith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Editorial Expression on Censorship The Chicago Tribune, in speaking of the attitude taken by the mayor of that city, said, quote, Intelligence does not need censorship. The greater the insistence upon censorship, the greater the denial that the community has intelligence. Censorship being in itself a denial of intelligence frequently proves that it itself is unintelligent. End quote. The Boston Transcript, in an editorial, said, quote, The framers of the organic law of the Commonwealth concluded their contribution to human happiness with the purposeful phrase, To the end it may be a government of laws and not of men. Upon Massachusetts, therefore, rest a peculiar obligation to oppose the tendency of the times to change by class legislation and executive censorship a government of laws to a government of men. The passion to limit by legislation or executive order the freedom of the individual is today the curse of the nation. End quote. The Boston Herald said, quote, The people are impatient of any censorship which limits that freedom, free speech, which they hold as a priceless heritage. They want exact fairness and justice for all races and creeds. End quote. The Chicago Examiner said, quote, if an official can impose his views on us in the moving picture house, the next attempt will be to tell the theater what it is allowed to show, and from that 
it is only a step to telling the press what it may print that would spell an end to criticism of public acts and public men it would substitute personal interest or personal prejudice for the truth as the standard in determining the right of publication end quote the chicago tribune in another editorial in regard to censorship said quote, the rights of the public are not to be abridged by bureaucracy but are under the protection of the judiciary the growth of censorship undoubtedly stimulated by the moving picture is a development which no american devoted to ideals of freedom can observe without alarm the use of censorship easily may tend to the misuse of it and the position of the courts as a corrective to check abuse of power by what is virtually an extra-legal authority and might easily become an autocratic and stupid authority must constantly be kept in mind End quote. in an editorial the boston american calls censorship of moving pictures a dangerous precedent quote, always ready for abuse whenever in worse days there should arise those who would dare to abuse it the liberty of free people is not protected by ignoring a danger because it seems to be distant and not heeding it until it has actually sprung upon us and holds us in a death grapple End quote. The Boston Globe said editorially, quote, to stop the free expression of opinion by any means is to close the safety valve, End quote. From the San Francisco Call, quote, the call wishes to announce itself as unadulterably opposed to the censorship of motion pictures upon the ground that such a censorship is a direct violation of the constitutional guarantee of free speech and free publication and in the sincere belief that the same laws and the same influences which now compel newspapers publications of all sorts and the theaters to remain within the proprieties would have the same and a sufficient effect upon moving pictures End quote from the macon georgia news quote, the agitation against this moving picture the birth of a nation was born of narrow-mindedness and ignorance if in truth it was inspired for sordid commercial reasons End quote. concerning the showing of the birth of a nation the houston texas chronicle says quote, the time has not come when the people of Houston are to have their standards of thought or taste set or fixed or regulated by the Negro citizenship, nor even by the board of censors. End quote. Referring to the birth of a nation, the westerly Rhode Island Sun states, quote, If such a spectacle must be forbidden, then there is no room on the stage for the merchant of venice or any other play that may be unwelcome to a relatively small element of the public in a given community End quote. the hartford connecticut current says quote, the best sort of censorship is that which does the least censoring occasionally very occasionally it may be wise to suppress stage productions and public utterances whether by the spoken or written word that are highly immoral or incendiary but for the most part it is wiser and safer to permit the moral sense and good judgment of the people to decide their fate End quote. an editorial in the rochester new york democrat says quote, Recent court decisions in Pennsylvania have been to the effect that the municipal authorities cannot interfere with the production of a film after it has been approved by the censors. 
This gives film censors dangerous powers and in a serious encroachment on municipal authority. End quote. Editorial in Lowell, Massachusetts, Core Citizen says, quote, Public censorship of stage productions, pictorial or otherwise, is a difficult authority properly to exercise. It is causing trouble wherever it is attempted. End quote. Editorial in Cleveland, Ohio Leader. Quote, One suggestion from an authoritative source is that all the companies combine, agree on a test film, and once for all determine not the links to which the censors can go, but their right to pass on any film. End quote. Referring to the birth of a nation, the Cincinnati, Ohio Inquirer says, quote, There does not seem to be much doubt, but that political expediency has been served by the censorship decision. End quote. Chicago Examiner Editorial. Quote, the American people are justly uneasy at the institution, new to us, of censorship. We progress fairly well without it until the advent of the moving picture, and our press and stage have to be cleaner and more moral than those of other countries where an official has to pass on everything published or shown. The whole plan of censorship is contrary to the spirit of our country. End quote. Speaking of motion picture censorship, the Boston Post says, quote, The average book, play, or newspaper is not subjected to any such long and persistent series of annoyances. But for some reason or other, the photoplay is treated as an infant in swaddling clothes. Every moment of its young life must be carefully scrutinized. End quote. End of section four. Section five of the rise and fall of free speech in America by D. W. Griffith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Press Censorship in Russia Today, the freedom of the press is practically unknown in Russia, the most autocratic and tyrannical of all civilized nations. In Russia, the democratic parties are forced to get their pamphlets, books, and other literature printed abroad or in secret printing offices. Quote, the periodical press of the two Russian capitals is, for the most part, relieved from preventative censorship if it submits itself to what penalties may be adjudged suited its trespasses against the views of the authorities. These penalties are very efficient for the end in view. There is a system of warnings. After three of these, a paper is liable to total suppression. Falling short of this capital punishment, newspapers are suppressed for periods of three, six, or twelve months, or they are subjected to heavy indirect fines by being forbidden to print advertisements for a specific time, or they are not allowed to be distributed by sale to any but their regular subscribers. The provincial newspapers printed in Great Russia are, with one or two exceptions, reduced to a state of contemptible impotence and insignificance. This is not hard to understand when one remembers that they have not, like most of the papers of the two capitals, been relieved from the preventative censure. The vexations and delays of the system may indeed be hard to endure, 
Censors are only fond in large towns, and the editors have to await their good pleasure before they receive back the proof sheets. If any difficulty arises, the question must be referred to a censorship committee. Of these, there are only eight or nine in the whole empire. So the delays involved in a reference to one of them may easily be imagined. End quote. Russian Politics, H. M. Thompson. Quote, this bondage of the provincial press is one of the principal obstacles in the way of the reforms becoming practically efficacious and the way or any control of government by public opinion it is one of the things which deprives the new administrative self-government the zimstavovs and the municipalities of much of their usefulness again here we have one of the causes which account for the ignorance of the russians of the capital of highly placed functionaries and of the government itself concerning what is going on in the interior of the empire how can the evils from which the people suffer the abuses of the administration the illegalities of local authority be brought to the knowledge of the higher authorities by a press which has hardly more independence than the telegrams or reports of the governors. In Russia, the provinces are dumb. The weekly organs which essay to speak in their name have nothing about them either of liberty or spontaneity. Their mechanical language tells nothing to anybody. End quote. M. Leroy Ballou. End of section five. Section six of the rise and fall of free speech in America, by D. W. Griffith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Federal License of Moving Pictures A House Bill Discussed by Martin Littleton The strongest and most eloquent argument yet made against federal censorship was delivered before the House Committee on January 19th by ex-representative Martin W. Littleton of New York. Mr. Littleton's speech was, in part, Congress must not impose the burden of finding out what the will of the people is upon an appointive, irresponsible commission. It must not abandon to such a commission its duty of ascertaining and declaring the will of the people. If it be the will of the people, and I have no doubt it is, that immoral pictures or films shall not be exhibited, and if we have come to a point as a nation where we are willing to enter upon a law-made censorship of what we shall see, read, and hear, and if the police power of the states is so prostituted that states will not protect the morals of the people, and if it is now the duty of Congress to turn the will of the people into law, all of which is challenged, then Congress must not set up an oracular oligarchy of five bureaucrats as the medium for the expression of the will of the people. What is an immoral picture or film? Who can answer that question? Must that question be answered for one hundred million people by five men, whom they do not choose? Must that question which reaches from the nether sewers of flagrant immorality into the very stars of an ethical firmament, be answered for every man, woman, and child in the nation by a group of quixotic and querulous old gentlemen, solemnly settling the morals of a nation by presidential appointment. What is immorality in a picture or film? 
shall the educated amusement loving men and women of america call on congress to answer the question and then shall congress in turn leave it to a body of five men to answer it what is an immoral film or picture which shall be withheld from the view of the public if congress is speaking for the people will it write into the law an answer to this question or will it remit to us an appointive board for the answer do the people demand that congress shall enact laws prohibiting immoral films or pictures if so will congress obey that demand and write a law setting forth what the people wish prohibited as immoral or will it answer the demand by telling the people that it has turned over that great question to five appointive and underpaid men if all this is answered by saying that congress cannot define what is or what is not an immoral picture and cannot write a law which will fix a standard then how can we say that five nominees of the president will be blessed with the wisdom or endowed with the genius to strike the line of cleavage between a moral and an immoral film or picture must we be censored by law-made boards as to what we shall see hear and read or shall we leave this to the corrective force of public opinion which is the very fire and flame of a democracy we are a democracy shot through and through with the force and fervor of public opinion our great press without whose tireless production of the facts and courageous advocacy of public question popular government must relapse into the darkness of provincialism and prejudice has without a single challenge from the nation the state or the city since the foundation of the government stimulated and preserved a consistent public opinion it narrates from day to day all the happenings in human society it publishes the pictures which tell the story of every feature and phase of human life social economic moral and religious it comments with the utmost freedom on every aspect of human activity it catalogues the accidents crimes disasters shortcomings failures and heartaches of the human race it analyzes mercilessly the public questions social controversies religious disputes and all the purposes and motive and passions of mankind it debates and freely criticizes everything which flows out of the life of men and measure it is the eye the ear and the tongue of the nation seeing hearing and talking of everything under the sun our books tracts magazines our acted plays our stage our drama our public speeches and debates everything which the eye can see or the ear can hear of picture or controversy behind the footlights or in the forum every instrument employed for painting printing promulgating or proclaiming an idea or a thought or a feeling or a passion has been left to the corrective force to the rare restraint to the sound wisdom to the exalted self-respect of that great board of numerous censors unappointed and unpaid the american people if for any reason which can be discovered there should be law-made censorship of what we shall see and read and hear why does congress assume to act upon this question the various states enjoy almost exclusively the power and have enjoined upon them the duty of protecting the lives the liberty and the property of their people and especially of conserving the morals and health of the people there will be found in the statutes of almost every state if not all 
a provision which empowers the authorities to proceed against a play a picture or a publication which threatens to debauch the honor or corrupt the morals of the community in the very bosom of these domestic sovereignties known as the states resides the power and the solicitude which may be confidently relied upon to shield their people from evils which threaten their health or their morals this is so for many reasons but for none more striking or convincing than that the state hover closer over the family hearthstone and reach nearer to the family altar the education of the children the training and discipline of the youth the protection of the man and the woman the guarantee of freedom in the pursuit of happiness the manifold securities in the various fields of industry the laws of enlightenment and humanitarianism which have found their way into the mine and the mill and the factory these and numberless others have come and in the future must come from the guardian hand of the state which is always extended unrestrainedly over the welfare of its people End of section 6. Section 7 of The Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America by D. W. Griffith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Censorship Dragon. Let the American people stand in fear and trembling of the eventual outcome of the insidious growth of censorship powers. Censorship is no fantastical bugaboo. It is a real national peril, because the day may not be far off when censors, under the shadow of the American flag of independence, will be empowered by the legislative enactment to foist their individual whims, hobbies, or prejudices on the suffering public. It is not beyond our imagination to see a fanatical functionary with the title of censor who is a vegetarian, forcing the people of his city to abstain from meat. Other censors with similar whims might censor tea and coffee, cigars and cookbooks. Already it is reported ministers are sensing the possibilities of their pulpits being ruthlessly purged of objectionable texts. In the light of such impending calamities, is it not about time to lop off the head of the censorship dragon? All that seems to be needed is the doughty St. George. End of section 7 End of the Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America By D. W. Griffith Recorded by Chuck Williamson, 2013, Columbus, Ohio